Okay, good evening, everyone. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Trinidad Planning Commission for February 21st, 2024. Bear in mind that uh, this uh, meeting is a hybrid meeting, it is held in person and also via video conference hosted on the Zoom platform. So anyone who signs into Zoom, we will try to make sure that if you have any comments or questions, just please raise your hand and we'll try to get to you uh, as quickly as we can. Um, first item on our agenda this evening is the roll call. Uh, Commissioner Slade? Right here. Commissioner Cole? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Here. And Commissioner Hopkins and Commissioner Hakenen are absent. So let me just note that as um, since we are only have three uh, commissioners here this evening, uh, we just verified what the process is for decision making. And we only need a majority of the quorum for any decision this evening. That means that two to one could either approve or two to one could disapprove anything that we have to vote on. So I just wanted to confirm that so everyone understood the rules for this meeting's session. Okay, the next item on our agenda is uh, approval of the minutes. We have one set of minutes for approval uh, from uh, January 17th. Any questions, comments, clarifications from the commissioners? I had just one real simple typo, Trevor, which is on page one of the minutes. Um, under public uh, uh, public hearing, uh, the item one, Morrison, the last sentence there, I think is just a cut and paste issue, trained it at 2023 03, update the property, temporary closure of AMLT. It's covered elsewhere. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Any comments, questions, clarifications from the public? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next item, which is approval of the agenda. Of the agenda, we have two items for public hearing discussion, decision, and action. First one is uh, update of temporary closure of AMLT. Richard, do you need a uh, vote for approval of the minutes? Excuse me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm out of practice. <laughs> <laughs> I have moved to approve the minutes as amended. Second that. Any further discussion? You're none on the aye. And it's our proof. Thank you very much for the help. Oh, yeah, guys. Yeah. All needed. Yes. Okay. okay. Next item, as I said, was uh, approval of the agenda. We have actually three items, excuse me, for uh, public hearing tonight. Trinidad AMLT closure, uh, EWAL, a design review, permit, permit, use permit, because of development permit for new construction. And then a review regarding the draft ADU ordinance. Changes to the agenda. None. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Move and second. Any further discussion? None. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is approved. Next item on our agenda is items from the floor. This is an opportunity for anyone in the public on Zoom and here in person to make comments to the commissioners uh, on any issue that is not on the agenda this evening. We request that you your comments to a maximum of three minutes. Do I hear any comment? Someone on Thank you so much. We will have the item. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on then to the next item, which is our agenda items. First agenda item is um, uh, update on the temporary closure of the Axel Lindgren Memorial Trail and progress to date to reopen the trail. Uh, Trevor? So this is just my monthly update um, on the temporary closure of the Axel Lindgren Memorial Trail. Um, 
which was approved as emergency action last year um, due to erosion at the base of the bluff there. Um, the Parker Creek Trail, uh, there were some repairs accomplished and that was reopened. The Axel Burden Trail remains closed. Uh, we presented at the last meeting a repair plan um, short, for short term light touch repairs to get the trail open. Um, the city's goal is to have that open still by Memorial Weekend. Um, the the trail it does does soil disturbance in that area requires approval of a, of a variety of different groups. Um, the city has requested a meeting with the trail management team. Um, what, as of the time of writing the staff report, we hadn't heard back from uh, the ancestral society, but we had heard back from the and the coastal conservancy. Um, but we did hear from them today, so they will try and make that meeting date, which will be next week, I believe. Um, so hopefully we can discuss and maybe we'll hear about their report um, for regarding the trail. Um, regardless, that um, temporary closure is going to expire, both the Van Wick and Axel and Brand trails in March. Um, so you will be seeing both of those uh, March likely staff will be requesting additional temporary closure time on both of those. Um, hopefully we'll have some progress or progress to report that. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, yeah, you said that or in here, it looks like you met with the Coastal Commission earlier this week. To Actually, yeah, we met uh, with the Coastal Commission yesterday, primarily to talk about the Van Wyck Trail, um, because that was Coastal Coastal Commission itself had you know, told the city that they want to see that open in six months. Um, so we've been meeting regularly with them. Um, they had an interesting update, it sounds like, they've kind of taken this issue up, up the chain with their staff. And because of they, they met with the Ancestral Society a, a few months ago, and there's also been correspondence from the York tribe requesting that the trail be closed because of cultural reasons. So it seems like Coastal Commission staff may be uh, in favor of closure at this point. Um, Mr. Allen. Uh, um, Axel Lindgren is more complicated. Um, I think everybody wants that open. It's part of settlement agreements. It's a, a historic cultural trail. Um, so that one, I don't think anybody has any desires to have that close long term. But Van Wick is probably the direction we're going and with, with improvements to Edward Street. Further comments? Uh, so the short term fixes for the Axelinga Trail. Those, is there any chance those would become before the Planning Commission before they get sort of approved by the management team, or it has to go through the management team before it comes? No, I think it. Well, we it was basically the same. What I sent them was the same thing that you guys saw last month. So just sort of an outline of, of what needs to occur. That's what we sent them as a starting point of discussion. Yeah, I guess, right. But in terms of like an actual project that we might, we might decide to go through the it, You know, there's not necessarily one has to come before the other. Um, yeah, we do have to have the ancestral system. I think it's the, the Rancheria, it's the lineal descendants of Chirai and the State Historic Preservation Officer. I think are the approvals that we need for, for any soil disturbance down there on that trail. So we do need those approvals. Now we could potentially condition a planning commission action on 
getting those approvals. Um, it would ideally we would have the management team, at least a consent, you know, a, a agree at least a tentative agreement on that before we would. I just wanted to, if indeed it was the, the remedies that were presented at our last meeting that got passed along, I wanted to reiterate um, looking for some sort of creative solution at the toe of the board, right? Like some sort of standalone metal staircase or something that would in fact minimize soil disturbances. So whether that's an avenue around policy 69 or not, I think it's something worth investigating. Honestly, I think it's interesting. For the comments? I'll just uh, ask for one clarification, Trevor. Uh, on page one of the, the report under update, uh, you say the city has sent a request to the Chiri management team. I completely understand that. Uh, then the last sentence of that paragraph says the TAS have not responded to the request thus far. Uh, it's not clear to me, was that supposed to be the management team or actually TA? TAS. The TAS. So we have heard from okay. we had heard from the Conservancy and the Yurok Tribe um, first, but not the TAS. Thank you. But now we have them, so I think we're going to look forward. I mean, it was tremendously helpful to have some legal counsel present at the previous discussion. Do you think it would be worth inviting TAS counsel maybe the city to also this discussion to make sure we're not running a file of any legal complexities as we discuss possible solutions and openings and closing. Yeah, uh, definitely any proposal, any action we brought to you would certainly go through at least the city attorney. Um, but yeah. Um, I, I don't want to run that out of my way. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Uh, any comments or questions from the public on this agenda item? Closure of the Axel Lindgren Memorial Trail. I hear none. We'll move on to our next agenda item. Uh, agenda item number two, Beanie Wald, 2023-01. Is that correct? Yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, design review, grading permit, use permit, and a coastal development permit to construct a new two-story, three-bedroom, 3,229-square-foot residence. Uh, Trevor? Yeah. So um, I'll just quickly go through some of the highlights in my staff report. I won't necessarily touch on everything, but I'm certainly able to answer questions and then the applicant and the applicants also here. To provide some additional information, um, so this this project is located off Langford or Langford Road. Um, I haven't heard back from the assessor on whether they can provide some some any, any insight into that. I'm going to call it Langford um, for now. So and so sort of between Langford and Scenic Drive, um, it, it's sort of wedged in between there. Um, the property was part of the subdivision back in 2007. So there are a variety of, of studies and reports that were prepared for the subdivision um, that inform the placement and design of, of the house. Um, those have been followed. Um, some, some of the reports have been updated. Um, the geologist, one of the geologists who worked on it went to the site and provided a, an update. Um, the uh, a botanist went out there um, looked at habitat. So, um, so there's a variety of background reports and information um, regarding the site. Um, it's so it's kind of the approvals are a little bit complicated. It's really just just a new house, but it's a it's a big lot. It's a big house, a long driveway. Um, so, and some tree removals involved, so that the use permits required as part of the, the tree for removal of trees over 12 inches, um, grading permit because of the amount of soil disturbance and area being disturbed, um, the design review for the house, and the soil permit, which that's what we do those. Um, the, Sent out referrals for this project. Um, comments back were the health department did approve the, the OWTS for this, so that's good. 
Um, the engineer had some comments and questions about the drainage and erosion control. Um, the applicant did prepare a drainage plan that's included in the packet. Um, and that was in consultation with the city engineer's office. So we haven't isn't signed off on that yet, but that's been included as a condition of approval that that will need to be um, the engineer approval on that prior to construction. And then um, the TIPO from the Trinidad Rancheria commented that this is in their area of concern and so requested that a cultural monitor be on site during so disturbing activity. So that has also been included as a condition of approval. The site is zoned um, suburban residential, which is a, a sort of a rural residential zone. So low density, uh, single family housing um, is, is the primary use there. Um, the project does meet all the height and setback and parking and all those kind of standards zoning requirements. Um, you can see here the, the house is, is fairly large, but it's, you know, 3% Florida area ratio, so we sometimes look at 10% on the SR zone properties. Let's see, grading. So uh, it's not in the MS4 stormwater area, so it didn't have to include, um, we didn't have to go through the, the stormwater process steps, which was disappointing because this would have actually been the first project that would have been subject to those because of its size. Um, but they are including some drainage swales anyway, so those, those, that, those are kind of the requirements of that ordinance anyway. Um, the driveway is fairly long, but it's it's basically existing all in the, the existing contours of the site. Um, R1 geologic report was prepared for the subdivision. Um, all those recommendations are included as, as a conditions of approval for this project. Um, the geologist came out, looked at the site and, and, and the plans and said everything was consistent and, and the conditions haven't changed on the site. Um, this is in a earthquake fault hazard area, so there was a fault study done as part of the Subdivision and the house is within that building site that was identified. Um, the steep slope above Scenic Drive on the south side of the property is uh, is mapped as being questionably stable. Um, and so uh, the geologists also looked at that. Uh, there will be some trees removed there, but the stumps will be left in place, and um, some native landscape native plants will be planted there. Uh, to screen the site and stabilize the soil. Um, and the report found that the project would not be subject to instability or causes. Um, the septic design has been, the leach field has been designed to include a future ADU. That approval is not, you're not approving that tonight, um, the, the future ADU, but the leach field has been sized to accommodate an ADU in the future. An ADU would require an tank, its own tank. Um, but the, the help the, the septic system's been approved. Uh, the botanist found that there was no environmentally sensitive habitat areas on the site. Um, so that's not an issue in terms of setbacks. Um, the applicant is proposing to remove 19 trees for a variety of reasons. Um, solar access, views, um, remove some trees. So those are covered in um, the application. Um, there will be some additional plantings, as I mentioned, on the slope to help screen the site. There were some comments from Postal Commission staff and responses um, from the applicant and those. I think those have been adequately covered. And then the rest of the staff report are the use permit findings. Those are oh, that's only related to the tree removal and then the design review for, for the structure. Um, as usual, those findings have been written in a manner to allow approval. Um, but if you feel differently or the public submits information um, that conflicts with those findings, they should be reworded accordingly. 
Um, staff recommendation is for approval. There's a, a sample motion for approval in there, um, but you do have alternatives to add, add conditions um, to address other concerns or continue the project to obtain information or deny the project if you feel that the findings one or more that you can't need. Um, most of the conditions of approval are fairly standard. Um, there's one more specific to the grading ordinance and the city engineers sign off and approval. There's the all recommendations from the LACO report. Um, the, there is a permit required from the county, so part of the property is in the county's jurisdiction, so they have applied for the encroachment permit for the end of the driveway the road and and then the, there's um, 10 is for the cultural monitor but then i added a couple to the driveway to protect the leach field so a curb or, or bollards to keep someone from driving off the driveway and on the leach field and to make sure drainage is electric that is my report and i'm happy to answer your questions Okay, um, this is um, a little bit more complicated than just a, a simple <laughs> a reconstruction of a piece of property that we've seen before. So I was trying to figure out how we could break it down and maybe figure out the best way to get clarification on this. Um, maybe I would suggest that uh, first thing we do is perhaps if we have any clarifications in the staff report itself, just just. Uh, that we go through that, if that's okay with you, and um, and then uh, it probably is ideal to have the agent and the uh, uh, the owner, property owner, to uh, maybe brief us, and we'll be somewhat flexible in the amount of time that we give them because this is a little bit more complicated than what we normally see. And then, of course, the public will have a uh, opportunity to comment, and then we'll. Go back and forth a couple of times i'm sure so um if that's acceptable then we'll proceed that way okay so the first item is if you have any questions for trevor on the staff report per se i have eight questions for trevor um and so i'm happy to go first or go last or take turns or whatever um and and uh commissioner johnson sorry chair johnson as you've said you know this is a pretty complex application and I just hope that uh, the sheer number of questions I've got both for Trevor slash applicants agents aren't interpreted as uh, you know that is but rather just indicative of my own naivete so I just want to preface all of this with that um so the first question I've got for you Trevor is um your staff report it uh you know describes that there might be this ADU that may be formally proposed in the future, but some of the supplementary, supplemental materials make it clear that is definitely a plan of the... Yeah. Letter from Mr. Ewald uh, justifying removal of plants, and it mentions, you know, that project will be proposed in a future application, which conveys some sense of certainty to me. Uh, so my question is, are there any risks or pitfalls of separating these two projects, considering them separately? I mean, the building envelopes are sufficient? That you can... No, yeah, you know, I think, and that was part of the purpose of showing it on the site plan to show that there is the space available within that buildable portion. Um, if, you know, where it's proposed, it wouldn't require additional tree removal. Um, and again, the, the leach field has been sized to accommodate it. So, um, and they'd have to come back for approval in the future. So, you know, I guess it's it would be their own problem if there were pitfalls. Yeah, right. like, you guys would either hamstring ourselves or they would be hamstring yeah. the whole thing. So yeah. I just wanted to ask that question right off the bat. All right, on to question number two. Um, so I got a copy of the soils reports uh, from Lindbergh Geologic Consulting and the more recent updates. In the more recent updates, Mr. Lindbergh writes, this letter will also address the concerns relevant to the soils report that were raised by the planner for the city of Trinidad. And so 
and ask you to recall those concerns that he's referencing? And are there any that don't appear in the staff reports? I think he misunderstood, and that was the Coastal Commission's letter that he was actually. But we have all of those concerns in front of us, nevertheless. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, and I assure you, I mean no offense by this, because this is in no way meant to question Mr. Ewald's qualifications, because I Googled him, and it seems that yes, he does in fact know a thing or two about forestry. Um, but uh, are there ethical or legal implications of allowing any applicants, not just Mr. Ewald, to use their credentials to make assertions on their own applications and their history of the planning commission? Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, applicants who have those professional expertise and, and licenses um, should be able to save some money and do the work themselves, I think. Um, it's not an issue we run across in Trinidad a lot, but, um, well, I mean, so for the Davies project, they didn't hire an architect, they did their own drawing. Um, you know, it's not exactly the same thing, but we had to trust that their site plan was what they were representing it to be. So, you know, it's, it's his license and qualifications putting it on the line, um, in a sense. So, you know, regardless of the professional, uh, and we don't have any reason to not. Yeah, like I said, I have no reason to doubt yeah. any of his qualifications. Yeah. Sure, I, mean, I was just curious about ethical yeah. qualifications. Yeah. All yeah. That's all we need to decide. <laughs> do have a license in good standing as a professional court. There is an allegation of some sort of malfeasance on my part, the licensing action, but the licensing board actually would review such an allegation to take action. Regardless of those, you know, that license and jeopardy from being towards the zeros. But, uh, but no, unless there are consequences, and there's a, a board that takes these things. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I would point out too that we've had general contractors come to the planning committee projects of their own. So I think this is, I think, my 12th or 13th meeting. I just wanted to say that <laughs> because I don't have a whole lot of experience here. Uh, seek some clarification there. All right. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on to question number four, halfway through. Uh, on packet page 21 of the staff reports, um, you quote one of the geological reports, uh, it is our professional opinion that the proposed new residence, septic systems, including reserve fields, and driveways as proposed on the site appear to be suitably and sufficiently set back from the potentially unstable lands to ensure site stability. And continuing, it is our opinion that the proposed site developments can be constructed as proposed without being subject to or exacerbating existing soils and or geologic hazards associated with the project location. So that's the engineer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the engineer. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's the geologist. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sorry. Both meeting. Uh, so they explicitly mention a lot of things, but do not explicitly mention tree removal. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, just to clarify, is tree removal development in this context, or is it omitted from that list purposefully? I assumed that you know he reviewed the plans and the plans include the tree removal. So I assume that when he says development, it's included in it. But maybe the applicant has some additional information. I have a request here. Could both of you speak into the microphone? Sure. The difference. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking this because there's one specific sentence in the uh, in the staff report, um, which is that the geologists found that there was no impacts to slope stability from tree removal. And I had a look through the geological reports that you sent me, and I didn't see any mention specifically of tree removal, which makes me question whether they're including that in development or not. And I think naturally I'm a bit skeptical of that claim that removal of trees uh, doesn't affect slope stability. You and I will. That because I know nothing about forestry and certainly do. Um, so I'm just curious uh, which geologist made that statement and in which report. Yeah, I I made the assumption that when he reviewed the development, he was including the tree levels and stuff. The generally development in this context? Sorry, that was it would be part of the project, yeah. So again, he would have reviewed these plans that you're seeing, which included tree removal. So I can uh, clarify, at least in the discussion I had with them on site. Sure. So I went through the draft plans that the two had for us, including all the site work 
Sure. Neil, Neil, excuse me, uh, again, if you wouldn't mind coming to the microphone, oh, because uh, we yeah. record this and we want to make sure that everybody yes. in, can hear. Okay. Yes, okay. In response to the question, did the geologist have any chance to review? No. I, I showed him the plans, which include the draft report, essentially the same that you've seen there in terms of the size and the scope of the project, which included tree removal. And so he was uh, aware of that and he was outside of the tree removal. I let him do what he had to do, and I paid him fifty. So I didn't try to influence him. So we looked at it. a related question. Okay, but uh, the references to slope stability do they refer specifically to that sort of southernmost margin of the property, or does that include like the entire slope from one hundred eighty? Oh, uh, the entire soil. Um, so the way it's mapped, you know, the the mapping that was done in 1976 isn't super accurate. Um, and so looking at it, though, it appears like the intent was to follow that break in slope above scenic drive. So it, it's the entire slope. Much of it is unstable. Um, the upper parts are mapped as being questionably stable and it extends up to that breaking slope of scenic drive. Got it. Um, again, not uh, this is not a guy my own naivete. Um the most recent update from the geologist was dated January as I recall. Us are stamp fifth again not to trust anybody. Are there procedural or legal issues with the site plan that did? So the changes were primarily um, related to the, well, I think totally related to the addition of the visual assessment and the drainage plan. Mm -hmm. And then um, Julia, the architect, sent an entire new set to me just put together with a new date on it. I didn't see any other changes. Yeah, that would have been my assumption, but I just wanted to question there. Uh, two more questions, which I think are easier to answer. Um, what do we do with the comments from the Coastal Commission? Like, what's our... Yeah, they were recommendations. Um, the project, mo most of the project area, at least where the building site is, is in the area that's appealable to the Coastal Commission. So if they decide they're not satisfied, they could appeal the project. They, you know, their their letter included recommendations. It's not, it doesn't compel the city necessarily to do anything. Um, and I think the applicant did adequately address those comments. And um, I haven't, and I did send them the updated information and I haven't heard anything. Thank you. This is my eight. Um, what is a forest or timberland conversion permit? I do not know. That is a um, that would be Cal Fire as a different then, agency. Then strike the first part of the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have any questions specific to the staff report. Um, I do have some conditions excuse me, questions regarding the conditions, but I don't think quite so the conditions even, so maybe I'll save this for later. Good. Okay, um, I guess, again, I, I'm probably in the same boat. Uh, I think I'd like to hear from the uh, property owner and the uh, agent uh, probably will answer a lot of the questions that we have, or at least clarify some of the issues. But I did have a couple of things, Trevor, that, um, I wanted to understand, uh, this is the first time I've heard of a rancheria area of concern. Me too. I, and I haven't so, seen um, Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, get some clarification on that, certainly not tonight, but in the future, because this is something I have never heard of before. And um, uh, it's something that we should be aware of, I think, so. Like yeah, and I, you know, as we've talked about before, I think we're moving in the direction of, you know, probably all projects will have culture. 
on my soft contact zone. Yeah, I just, uh, I, like I said, this is, I, I understand sphere of influence, Trinidad's area of influence, but I've never heard that the Rancheria has invoked that, so I would like to make sure I understand that. Um, I just as a heads up to the agent and property owner, I, I have some questions about these um, fiber rolls. And so when we get an opportunity to hear from you, I, I'm, I don't quite understand how permanent they are. And so uh, I'd like to understand that in, in more detail. Um, very quickly. Again, I think most of my issues will be clarified once we get into the discussion. Um, uh, one thing, um, I'll, I'll hold that off to on conditions of approval as well. So, uh, any other questions that uh, we have on the staff report? <laughs> I think I've asked my fair share. I'm satisfied. Okay. Um, then what uh, I'd like to do is uh, give the property owner and the agent an opportunity to maybe brief us very quickly for, all, for the overall project. And then uh, there are a number of questions that at least I know and probably all of us have with respect to the drawing package that we just need clarification on. And um, so um, I don't wanna take a lot of time, but we certainly want to give you the opportunity to uh, clarify the project and help us understand. Many of you already know me, but I'm Julian Berg, the architect that uh, Neil has hired to do the project. And I'm a local guy born and raised here, so it's really exciting to work on something in our community. Um, I really love working on designs and buildings that I think are appropriate for North Coast Senate. Um, Neil and his family have been great to work with on this. It's a project he's been wanting to do a long time and a place for his family to gather. Um, We've also been working closely with Trevor and the rest of the city staff to ensure that the project is meeting uh, the, or exceeding the standards that the city is requiring. Collaborating with several local professionals. Really great, we have all engineers and educated people that help do all these studies that are required um, for both geological onsite septic, the stormwater and drain botanical study. Um, let's go ahead and go to the site plan. And I'll briefly go through this because I think you've all in the market. So it went. You might try the arrow button. Yeah. yeah, there you go. We're keeping the driveway entrance at the existing location. As you can see there, there's already a sort of a temporary gate and access way. And it's the driveway meanders back to the house site. Um, we, Neil and I did a lot of meetings out the site to figure out where it should go and determine this great spot. Um, it's from Langford and Scenic when you're out there looking at it. Um, we're keeping most of the vegetation, well, all of it along Langford. It's there now, and most of it along Scenic. Um, the garage is tucked underneath. You can see this our triangles are. Um, we did this to work with the existing site contours and help hide the garage. It also allows the house living space to be higher and for better solar gain and sun access. 
the lower southern section, you can see a hatched area laser pointer. I'm going to have that in my bag from now on, I think. But that berm help um, views up to the house and then also from the house, it will help wing or a traffic noise from scenic. We're going to plant that with native plants and shrubs. It's going to look like it really fits in. The septic will be in the same open grass area, which, as Trevor pointed out, it is designed to accommodate both the house and the ADU. One of the reasons we wanted to do that is just to be sure this would all fit in the long term. Um, Neil doesn't have any intention of building the ADU in the immediate future on budget and how everything goes. But it's nice to have the option to do that and we think we can get these days. Um, most of the large spruce and fir trees will be maintained. Um, we are, as Trevor pointed out, we're proposing to remove trees along the south side, along Scenic. Which, um, Yeah, the risk of falling on scenic. Um, of course, there's the threat of wildfire, which could start up scenic. It will also help the SRA fire departments. Um, we're trying to design the house as close as possible to net zero with a large solar array on the roof. Um, lots of south facing glass and perpetual gain is essential for this to function well. Um, we'll be planting the hillside below with um, a mix of ocean spray, seeing this ox myrtle, the silk castle, and salal. I'd be open to other suggestions of it as well. But the idea is as the stumps remain, they will rot away over time, but the, the roots of the native plants are kind of take hold in you know, three or four years and really stabilize that hillside. Um, why don't we go to erosion control plan, which is sheet A1.3. It's a couple of So we did a pretty extensive erosion control plan. And so you see the wider black lines, the raw wattles, which are pretty typical when you're doing development these days, especially with all of our waterway fossil um, sites. But these raw wattles, you can find them at most three yards. And they hold the soil and filter any water passing through. They probably last years before they fully disintegrate. Um, I've seen some last actually probably three. But once again, is that they'll sit there and hold any sediment back, you know, and maintain really until the plants would come in and uh, stabilize the soil. Well, you can see the blue hatched area there. We've got a couple larger swales are going to capture all the runoff and driveway runoff and keep it from going over the hill. I did review this several times with Dagan. <laughs> um, and we worked together on coming up with a plan that we think will work well. He hasn't officially approved it, but he gave me a verbal approval that this solution would be good. I added in an overflow because he was worried about if those swales were to fill up during a huge rain event, not your typical rain event, but a peak rain event. And it would potentially go over the metal side and cause erosion. But in this case, it would through a eight inch, a uh, six inch foot pipe. Actually, I did say Six inch HDPE plastic double wall training pipe. 
and that will go into a rock outfall and then down onto the road. But in my experience, I just don't think there's be much water. Yeah, because we have significant swells. The other thing that we are proposing in a metal roof, we could do rainwater collection for irrigation gardens. Let's, I don't know if I need to go into the floor plan too much, but I already talked about the garage being tucked under in the basement. Yeah, if you want to have to jump ahead to a two. After the visuals. So there's a garage tucked in on the basement level. But the main living spaces where we have the open kitchen living dining floor, which was important. In place type of house for the bathroom on the first floor. Um, and dog washing station. Yeah, there's a dog washing station. Well, <laughs> right on the deck. They're not allowed in the house. They don't have that, right? Large south facing deck. Top floor, we have an additional bedroom for then with the bathroom. Go ahead and jump into the uh, exterior. There's the roof plan, which you can see the solar panel layout. Showing the downspout locations. Next slide is getting into exterior views. So this is the main front view that pretty much from the road, but uh, we have large overhang for rain protection, terraces, bump outs, step roof heights, corner windows, sliding doors, exciting textures, which all help to break up at the massing of the building and contribute to pleasing and well balanced. But I'm biased, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so the exterior finishes I'm showing on this sheet as well, which is a palette of earth tones. Blend the structure with the natural stone elements. Also, as a wing, um, local rock plant like here in Trinidad. It really grounds the house to the site. The plant site. The elements fire resistant. We have high quality wind. Frames, density, and complement. Accent for wood and, and like the black standing seeds metal roofing, rainwater collection. And I think the black color will really help it blend in with the surrounding the air as well. It is all directed in that side front. Pretty much a requirement building on those uh, lighting options on sheet day two. I go through the visuals. I have maybe one question about the visual side. Well, I can do the questions at the end, but why don't I give you a quick overview of the visuals? If you want to go up, it's at the beginning. did a pretty comprehensive study, right? Yeah, here we go. Look at different sites around Trinidad just to be sure that the house was visible from locations. And this was one of the requirements of the commission. They really started the and doing 
not, we found that you really can't see it. I mean, with the way the existing trees and distances are to sites. So when I scroll down, I can kind of walk you through because I think it's clear where the locations are. Go ahead and go down to the images to the off site. And then there's existing 80 to 100 tall conifer trees where that touching is. So you're not going to see it all on the beach. And then go ahead. So you can see on the left there, there's a site, there's a large 80 foot tall there. It's really hard to see in the images, but the site is behind those trees. If you look at the second image, right. only United Healthcare Medicare Advantage plans come with a simple member card that only works for what that. We got you. Hundred feet. You're probably a couple hundred feet down in elevation, right? From maybe. 300 feet. Yeah. That's so far away. <laughs> so anyway, it, um, so we really don't feel this project will have any significant impact on neighbors. We're also mentioned project permit has already been associated with County for the driveway portion because this is a split jurisdiction. But at least we're getting um, a lot of time and energy has gone into this project, and we want to send the test apps to the park to turn it out. So thank you. project. And we're excited to take it to the next. Your comments. Can I ask one quick question before we step away from the podium? I think you well. should stay right I'm not there. going anywhere. <laughs> well, it's just like chain of floor. Could you scroll that <laughs> down to just since we've got sure. these now. images on this? Image number eight, and I could probably figure this out if I was smarter. Image number eight and nine. Can you tell us which yeah. parts of the house are indicated there in the red line? It's the first so, floor, right? Yeah, on image nine. And this is my best guess at this point since the house built. Um, that roof line there would, would be the. Um, Kitchen corner. If you look at the floor plan or kitchen corner there. And there's two shading hatching on there, the low itself. And then Cooper, did he? Oh, you're in. Plan. Cooper's in. Mama Cat's in. Diamond's in. On your iPhone, can you mute your me you mute yourself, please? Once okay. again, when you're on scenic drive, you're down. I don't know if you've been in on site, you're down quite a ways, so you, you really can't see it as you look up. Any other questions on the view set? Your questions, <clears throat> clarifications, comments? I don't have any questions. Um, I appreciate the thoroughness of this assessment of particularly the views. Um, obviously, that's a very sensitive topic here in town. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the applications is quite thorough. I, I appreciate leaving any stone mm -hmm. turned. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Berg, I've got nine questions for you. Okay. <laughs> um, and again, before I begin with those, I just want to, you know, reiterate those comments that it's clear that not only has it gone into all of this, but it seems to me anyway that you've had to jump through an extraordinarily high number of hoops. I don't know about the height of those hoops, but certainly a lot of them. So, so more than your typical residents. Uh, that would be my assumption. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, so. Again, being naive, 13th meeting, whatever. 
Could you walk me through the process of how you assemble a site plan? We'll see where I'm going eventually. Um, I guess okay. my first question is like, so there's features like property boundaries and fault lines and contour lines. And I assume that those aren't hand drawn or you know digitally placed. I even confirm some JS database somewhere, right? Um, it was subdivided, adjacent. They did a bit of mapping, so we used that to do this to create the contour layout. And then the property lines were done from a combination of county and maps and that subdivision map, which they had to do a pretty extensive report for that subdivision, actually, for one lot. But yeah, it's, it is also interesting that you know, drive it. Um, how that came about. And then when you're but, uh, in terms of the process of, well, I've got, I've got a few follow-up questions actually. Okay. Um, do you want do you want more information on the design process? In just a moment, yes, please. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so, like, when you're building a floor plan, for example, you just, is there like a door template and whatever program you're using, sort of like mm -hmm. drag it, snaps into place? And like, how do you? Well, we, just, just yeah, it's different. a door. Um, it's a door library part. It's a 3D part. I haven't developed a 3D into this because of the time that it takes. So I did a more. The plans are starting. Not the whole model. Sweet. It's got to improve it. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm I thinking... find that I like to start out with hand drawing because that's just the, my process. Makes it slow better, and I can think a little. There. Sure, the computers are so accurate, you know, you can be a little more. Well, I'm glad you That's actually uh, the crux of my question. I'm mm -hmm. curious about this geologic trench, whether it's placement on your plan uh, is the result of mapping or mm -hmm. whether it was sort of hand drawn by you or whether it came from a JS database. I guess my broader question is mm -hmm. was there any inference on your end about placement of that, uh, mm. of that no. line? It this was actually you can well see a little in summertime. It's very clear. You can see a lighter shade of grass and it's a little depressed. So Neil and I measured it from the top of that. Yeah, and it's exactly where it's supposed to be. The house is laid up. Yeah, you can see on the map. Yeah, that was me a question. I just wanted to ensure that you were one hundred percent certain about where that trench line is. Right, because it seems like yeah, but yeah, we've actually staked the house. And, and it settled, it seems, um, right? So it's a uh, concern. What is this? Neil and I have taken off. We did an initial staging of it, and then we kept adjusting the design as, you know, as we learned more and you know, decided to move some rooms around, make it flow better. And we we're always looking at where that trench line was, making sure it would fit. So, I mean, you can imagine why I'm curious about it, right? Because it really does sort of constrain. Uh, yeah, uh, it's going to do without a bunch of extra engineering. If you're 100 certain that that's where it is, and it's mm -hmm. planned appropriately around it, then I am satisfied with that. Um, I've got just two questions remaining for you. Then, um, what benefits were achieved? Next story. Uh, did you ever contemplate that grade? Mm -hmm. the benefit is. Partially the view and okay. partially the not what because of that geologic trench, we were pretty limited on our site area and they wanted to have some garden in front of the house, you know. But I say front, but I, um, and I would say those were the two main reasons. And to add interest, I think if it was all. One story with the basement, it would look too ranch like and kind of not be very interesting. All right. And uh, then I just got one more comment about design, just to encourage you to use. Um, I certainly appreciate the, mm -hmm. the downward directed lighting, mm -hmm. um, but I noticed that they are non dimmable. And I think that mm -hmm. there's a lot of benefits, both sort of aesthetically, mm -hmm. each of the pictures and stuff. Every single light is coming on the roof. Oh, yeah. say it right. Those are so inside out. Oh, that runs. They're also 2700K is the color temperature, which mm -hmm. tends to be a little more, I would say, in line with these lights. 
have a more yellow tone. Not I absolutely hate the okay. blue LED lights. They make me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So I have no additional uh, questions for the applicants, Adrian, but I, I'm looking forward to my upcoming um, lesson in forestry. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was just me. Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'll, I'll just go through a couple of things. Sure. Quickly. Um, um, one of the things uh, that I was uh, interested in is um, I'm kind of paraphrasing here because I don't recall exactly what it was, but in uh, page A1, uh, the map uh, fault, map trace of the Trinidad fault. Mm -hmm. So I understand that there was an evaluation made to say that every all the development was far enough away from that. Mm -hmm. And it specifically addressed the uh, septic tank, the leach field, the proper of uh, the uh, building itself. And I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure. Um, the one thing that is looks closest to me is the propane tank mm -hmm. and the associated lines of so, uh, you know, with, with that. I, I, are, can you verify that that is still within the range, the allowable range to the fault? You know, I have question if you can put a propane tank the, in there, but it's the 50 foot setback only applies to have a yeah have habitable right. structure so a garage, a garage could actually be outside of that so we're trying to keep you know death or injury from happening in habitable space so a propane tank slab wouldn't maybe i miss or a garage Maybe I misunderstood. I thought that they also addressed the uh, leach field as well, but maybe confusing myself. That was not part of the That was probably the R1. That might have been the R1 report. Did you look at? I didn't actually, I didn't send you the full report. It was a separate. That was the full on report by LACO done in 2000. Yeah, I sent them the R1 report, but I didn't send the fault report. Something like 35 or 40. Forty pages. I only printed the conclusions and recommendations of that one. Well, if by definition it is only habitable, mm -hmm. then that answers my question. But I just want to make sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that you do have to pro place a propane tank on a engineered slab. Yes, of course. Got yeah. rebar and all right. 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 Um. So uh, on uh, plate uh, A1.3, um, there's three little sketches here for some um, erosion control measures. And I understand um, we talked about the um, fiber roll. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't understand the first two, though. The infiltration trench detail. I don't even know where that is. Where okay. Is that? That is wherever you see the dashed black line. Oh, 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 to the oh, screen. oh. Basically, it's a French drain. You, have, you dig a trench and you place drain rock. I'm calling 3.5 inch diameter clean drain rock. Right. And that's placed basically in the fabric so it doesn't silt it up. Right. And that allow it the perforated drain allows water to percolate into the ground throughout that drain system. So by the time the drain gets to your swale, there may not be much water left. So the swale is kind of a. I, if you put it up on the screen, I can run over there and turn it out. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's the ones labeled French drains. Yeah, it's right. French drain to landscape. <laughs> I probably should have said per detail. Oh, I see. I yeah, did. I couldn't find detail one. That was what it was. Per detail. Okay. I got it. Okay. Um, now it happened. Okay. And then the item two, the pop up emitter detail, mm -hmm. I see that. And that's just basically as an overflow. Basically, that's at the tip of your grassy drainage swales. Any water that come up, then go to the swale. 
Okay, so there are multiple. Uh, there's two of those pop up in the, okay. at the end there's of two. each drain system. So there's one for the lower. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. I know these sheets are. There's a lot of info on each sheet. So let's see. Um, <laughs> so I okay. So I'm just walking through the the drawings here. So my question is, I, I really appreciate all of the images that you've taken in various locations. I, I'm amazed that this mm -hmm. Coastal Commission is now concerned about views like this, that they bypass some very large projects in the area. <laughs> right. Um, they had more staff. Uh, okay. <laughs> but my question is, um, there are no images from other parcels on Langford. I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. Let's see. If we go to the site plan, I think that was done because there was a request from the Postal Commission to these sites. Yeah, that's true. I would show us the sites based on the. I, I, I understand that. Oh, you're saying that they requested these specific sites? Right? Yeah, they didn't care about the adjacent okay. sites. Yeah. Because they care about public views. That's right. I understand. And okay. incidentally, I don't think they'll see the health. I'm doing my best to wait and see how. No, I, that's I, that's why I said I I think I knew the answer, but I wanted to make certain. So, um, I think that's it. That part. Uh, yeah. Um, any other questions at this point? Uh, not Mr. Bird, but um, yes. Okay. And again, the, uh, I, I will, we'll come back to the public so that uh, everyone has an opportunity to uh, um, so We're not done yet. <laughs> so I didn't have any prepared remarks. I'm happy to just talk off the cuff. And if you want to know anything about the history of the property, I've owned it for 15 years. Uh, we acquired it. Uh, we had a uh, contract a year before it was actually split um, because it took so long to get it through uh, the process. But uh, um, soon after we acquired it, my wife passed away uh, within five months. And so I kept it until now I've retired. And so now it's my project to build a house. And uh, so I've had a lot of time to think about what I want. In fact, uh, without Julian, I would have uh, brought to you a really horatious plan that you would have rejected, and I would have thanked you for it later. Uh, there's a 38-foot tall building that uh, a nice lady helped me design. Uh, uh, I, I was referred to uh, doing by Gabe in the city council office, and I uh, had a great time. Uh, this, uh, over several iterations, uh, the house had not even looked like what we started, uh, thankfully. Really, uh, I appreciate his make it turn into what I wanted, which is something that really is obscure from the outside, uh, exposes the views from the inside, uh, and then to have the, the beautiful panoramic view and the solar gains in the law system. So it's really kind of a dream uh, that worked. And it, it also fits into the contour of, this, of the slope. I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a sloping uh, a lot, and it just sort of seems to uh, fit the natural surroundings. So. I could go on and on if you like. I've got some specific questions for you, if you, okay, if you sure. don't mind. Um, and like I said, you know, I think the design is incredibly thoughtful. Everything that you've just said, I feel like that's very much true. Um, almost impossible to see it unless you're on a boat, right? Like it's <laughs> yeah, you can see it from the ocean, which is that means I can too see the ocean. Well, we're closed when I'm paddling around, I guess. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so my bigger concerns are with the tree yeah, um, and the use permit for the tree And um, I asked Trevor for your copy of the, the you know, justification or rationale for tree removal. Um, I've got just one copy, but I can pass it along if uh, you folks would like to see it. 
So uh, you've, you've broken it into the, you know, sort of discrete benefits that true renewable. I wanted yeah. to, again, not like put you on the defensive and, and make you justify all of this, but I do have some questions about sure. some of these things. Sure. Because really, um, you know, the, the finding or issuance of the use permit says, the proposed use at the site and intensity contemplated at the proposed location will provide a development that is necessary or desirable for and compatible with the neighborhood or the so they assess whether or not um, that finding can be met. I've got some questions about the proposed benefits of treaty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably the, the most straightforward of those is like, I mean, there's some, some trees here which pretty obviously got to go, right? Like tree S, that's where your porch is going to be. That's kind of, it's also a disease tree. Exactly, right? And that, right here. So that's, uh, I forget which disease it is, but foam use pine on. They changed the name since it went to forest school. school. It's called. Um, it's a, so so R and S got to go. I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay. But also, awesome. by the way, R is gone now. God took. No, it fell over in the wind. Which way did it go? It went. Uh... All right. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the mystery, the natural history of these conks, right? I feel like sort of most interested in like you know if there if there are these diseases how do they spread? I think spores are their fruiting body. Yeah, so uh, mushroom stuff. I don't well. Know. A foamy spina is also known as white speck. It's one of the most common diseases in person. We see it. It's endemic across the north coast. Often goes in through a scar of some kind. Um, and it's air. It's an air con. It's situated mid a bowl, often on one flank of a tree, and that's what you'll see one tree that's infected. Ultimately, the, the, the disease work that affects the tree, the, the tree will ultimately die often from a secondary fungus. Yeah. yeah so, are there are these the only two trees on the property that have some sort of disease? Well, I didn't look at the others specifically. I looked at all the ones that I cut down, but uh, superficially, one seemed to be fine. Question I was prepared to ask for question. I'm sorry, I didn't answer the question. Percentage of trees in that general vicinity, would you expect? But you haven't gone out and surveyed, so totally off the record, just. No, I would say yeah, you know, it's uh, Fulham's pine is one of the most uh, common diseases of Douglas fruit. There are other diseases, but other species, uh, but not the Ramorna, for example, sudden of death disease is pretty common around. Uh, the southern part of things, but not here. But I would say, if there are other comments about what uh, <laughs> you might find locally, you know, you can go out in the log yard and see quite a bit of white speck in the log. Um, so, how readily can the disease spread? I guess is one question. I mean, is there a chance that the future man would spread it to? Well, the sure. They, every year they they put spores out, and every has an open cord, a wound of some kind, or what have you, and it falls off. Possibly. So it is possible that, in fact, yeah. these trees remain in effects, not only other trees on your property, potentially affecting the screening that those trees offer, but also might affect neighboring trees. Is that true as well? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. You know, like the distance, those close travel, it doesn't matter. It's fine. I get it. All right. No, I, uh, you've stumped the band. Okay, perfect. Good. Then uh, I have no further questions. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, so this goes back to the question I asked uh, Trevor earlier. The assertion that removal of those trees has no effects on slip stability. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm confused a bit by the logic that the slope is clearly unstable, as evidenced by the pistol budding of the trees. Yeah, but simultaneously, removal of those trees doesn't actually affect slip stability. Sort of confused by that logic. So anyway, um, can you describe the predicted effects of removal of trees on slip stability, like those are forestry expertise? Yeah. So. Um, Conifer trees uh, of this size generally have a seven year, the root system generally has a seven year lifespan. And so over that seven year period, uh, you'll just slowly see that uh, root system decay. So that's why it's important to right away put something back in place that will create that same slope stability. But these are not deep seated landslides there. This is, if you've been out there, you know you can draw your finger in the sand on the sheer cliffs of uh, Scenic Drive. It's mostly uplifted beach sand. And so that's slowly sloughing away and sloughing down. And so uh, you can uh, affect the stability of that by 
um, putting something on it that will continue the moisture there. But it's pretty well drained. I mean, that's the nice thing about seeing the drains really well. In fact, I dug a hole five feet deep for the power pole that I have a permit for, and it rained five inches thereafter, and there's no water in the bottom of a five foot hole. And so uh, it, it drains pretty well. So I'm not worried about uh, a deep seated landslide moving. Um, but what could happen, and I think the most likely uh, windstorm, take those trees old because they're on that steep bank and they're on sort of sandy slopes. That if those trees, they're going to get bigger and bigger and get a bigger sail. And so it really isn't the ground stability itself. It's the fact that it's unstable ground with trees that have big roots anchored in it. And those, if you've seen just uh, seen it drive this last year, you've seen two or two trees that have already been moved. I've lived here 45 years, so I've seen a number of trees. For those that I predicted, in fact, uh, that's what you're predicting these trees will in fact. Ultimately, work. well, I mean, um, every tree goes over every point of view. Yes, I hope I live long enough to prove it so. But yes, those trees will fall over. So just, um, well, there's lots of good which I have more time to talk about forestry. Uh, so do you, seven years from now, mm -hmm. any consequences? These trees will be the No, it's, it's my objective. Uh, you see, I have a, also a, a vested interest in keeping the hillside where it exists. That's why I propose to put the uh, revegetation immediately and to do it also with what I know will work. I, I'm kind of a fan of ocean spray. I just like the way it looks. It's beautiful. And so I'd like to get that uh, array as best I can in that whole slide. I would also like to remove the pampas grass if I could. I didn't include well, that. Because well, 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 yeah. you might put it as a condition. I did not. If I'm strong, I'll get out by the time. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I think your question was seven years from now, what would the, I predict would happen? I predict uh, well area there with native plants. And that the trees that were at risk of blowing over. Are the, again, not knowing, not being a botanist, not being a forester, I don't really know a lot about the root structures of the existing trees versus the trees for bushes, shrubs, ocean spray, and the bottom. And the lot, mm -hmm. how do the root structures compare, right? Do they do they offer as much stability or more stability or less stability? Well, um, certainly, um, well, if you're uh, considering right. raindrop erosion, or, or the sheet erosion would come from different rain, right? As soon as you get a vegetative cover, you've, you've essentially accomplished that, right? And um, again, the erosion that I'm concerned about is what happens when the tree uh, erupts the whole root bought out of the ground, which you can drive down, drive on the sea. Um, now that, that will cause a tremendous amount of future climate. But what I think will happen is the big trees are removed, that's eliminated, and then I'll have some interwoven uh, shrubs that, you know, an ocean spray can get two inches in diameter or more in a mature specimen. And so it's going to be more like the, the blue blossom kind of cover, you see? Across again, across the, a lot of the scenic drive corridor. Okay. I need to talk about uh, tree removal or get a fit future. Does the so I, I mean that area on the southernmost part of the property has what would appear to be the steepest slope, right? Um, do trees? Uh, they would appear to be N, O, P, and Q, sort of creeping around the west of yeah. the those all, Are they also affected by slope instability, which is to say, do you suspect that those might all affect? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, which, I, of, which of those are the worst offenders? Oh, you want a grading system? I well, do. Yes, uh, very much so. Because you said they all can be removed, so I'm just curious whether, in fact, uh, well, there is a hierarchy. Well, if you look at the, the trees on top of the slope, um, they would be subject to the same kind of uh, effect. They would just, uh, the only trees actually that wouldn't cause this sort of effect of, a, of the two disease trees, the one that's gone over and the other one that's so far up, that it wouldn't have an opportunity to create bank erosion if it blew over. All the rest of them, when the roots come over, you know, the roots, uh, it's not entirely true, but if you look at the crown and then, then consider how big the root system is underneath it, 
you know, that's what you're dealing with in terms of the ability to disturb soil. Now, often rewards are smaller than that, but because they can break, you know, the um, you know, that could be a tremendous impact for essentially all of them. Yeah, something that occurs to me. Um, so all of the area where trees will be removed will be revegetated, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> are all of the trees immediately to the south of the property, the ones that we uh, were discussing initially, that's D, F, G, H, I, J, M, and N. Those are, the, uh, uh, those are all at least 30 feet in height at the moment? Yeah. yeah. Ah, there's one that's dead. And, you know, I could have uh, cut it, you know, the rules and cut one out. But I'm going to wait for people who are, uh, as much as I've had the time, the chance I'd rather have someone who's good with it do it all. So they are, in fact, uh, as you asserted, within striking distance of the property. I mean, they are, it would appear to be what now? They are within striking, but to use your term, uh, striking distance from the property. Yeah, of the house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because they would appear to be like the house is at least 30 feet from that break in the slope. Is that correct? So yeah, it would have to be at least 30 feet to reach the house. Yeah. Um, so these are, I think we said, what, 100, 120 foot trees that we posed in the. Those are the trees that are essentially this. These are the ones in one of the photographs we said that would remain on the adjoining property. They're, they're essentially consistent with that cohort of trees. Born at the same time. Oh, I was massively underestimating the size of those trees. Um, could you rattle off approximate heights of them if you don't mind? No. I mean, I'd just be guessing. That's I'd, I'd say 100 to 120 feet. And that's all of them? D, F, G, A? Oh, no, there's some of them that um, are shorter, of course. Which are those? I don't know. I think, Julian, you have some circles are bigger than others, so it does right. indicate that no, this like, Yeah. Yeah. F is the biggest, M seems second biggest. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I did measure them all, and, and I had the, uh, I don't know what to put in there, but I, I did measure them all uh, to determine that they were the, the smallest trees on the property, except for the one that's diseased, but all the big, what I call specimen trees. Those all are yeah. Yeah, so attachment nine on page 15 of the document. Which attachment? I'm sorry. Attachment number nine, page 15 of the document. I wrote the treatment. So this one right, was... Here, we'll show it to you. So just to just to keep sorry to hear what walking through your list of rationale for removal for your people. We've covered disease trees out there, geologic stability, still somewhat skeptical of some of those claims. Um proximity to proposed residents we've established now, as of this most recent uh discussion, that most of those trees are in fact within a certain distance of yeah. I um, you mentioned uh, that most of the strong winds accompanying winter storms arrive from the south, thus magnifying the risk that the trees may fall in the opposite direction towards the north, as that one did just fall towards the proposed home. Correct. Uh, but that justification wouldn't seem to apply to the trees that are to do south of the house. Well, it's still fall over. But yes, yes, you're right. They wouldn't necessarily strike the house in the path of the south fall of the tree or north fall of the tree. Okay. I mean, I'm just I'm trying to determine the extent to which each of your ethanol applied to each of you. Yeah, that's right. They, they're all not diseased and you know liable to fall over. They all don't require all the same justification. Well, well that's why they're you. Sorry. Yep, I'm on board with that. So I agree. Again, determine the the overall benefits. Um, 
Uh, which represents the most likely and immediate hazard? Trees falling atop the house or falling onto scenic drive? Um, you know, I don't know how to predict that. I certainly wouldn't write a report that, that, that put my license on the line that said this is going to happen fair or the, one or the other. Um, but they, they both represent risk, so just add the yeah, probability yeah. that they'll happen. Yeah, yeah, have you driven down some drive? Yeah. Have, have you seen the trees that have fallen? Uh, I don't know. I've seen the trees. I don't have a. I went there because the power was out. I want to see why. Knowledge but, of the trees uh, that exist on the Yeah, so the, the trees do fall. No doubt, trees fall. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, I, I travel a bit and sometimes I, I dabble in travel photography. So I've got this nifty app called Numbers. And it's pretty cool because um, you can like model, for example, how lengthy the Great Pyramid Shadow will be on the Autumnal Equinox 2027. Um, that's got some more practical applications. Uh, you know, I use it straight to uh, an engineering firm that a proposed new engineering building on the campus would actually shade the prized greenhouse. So they had to alter their plans accordingly. Um, and I, I plopped um, 100 foot posts uh, in the approximate location of some of these trees. I just looked at the shadow casts by those trees at different times here. No doubt in the winter, you know, relatively short trees will cast pretty long shadows into that southern exposure, right? Yeah. But, you know, by the time the vernal equinox rolls around, it looks to me like tree E casts a shadow on the house part of the time and only until about 9 30 a.m. Yeah. No, but I can't time, dispute how long the shade is on. Yeah, there. sure. And then by the time the summer solstice rolls around, uh, tree E doesn't appear to shade the proposed residence at all. Next. Uh, with the sun rising in the east northeast, the panels spend infinitely more time shaded by the proposed bedroom three on the second floor than any of the trees you're proposing to remove. So I, I guess I'm not quite sure why we're looking at individual trees. Is there an issue here of of the the, the plan holistically. Yeah, and so, right? so we've got this list of uh, proposed benefits of tree removal that we're trying to assess, you know, whether um, there's a net benefit to removal of these trees. Right? Yes. I and agree. so we have, we've been given this uh, this list of you know, many rational reasons, and I just wanted to work my way through them. Um, in the case of this uh, this tree, and, you know, I didn't have time at 11 to place it in their vision along that bank, but at least where tree E is, you know, in the summer equinox, there's no shadow casted by that tree. So, well, again, I guess what I was saying was that we're looking at this individual, each criteria for removal, we're looking at individually. When I look at this somewhat of a more higher perspective, I would definitely say that I would want to remove tree E for one of the other criteria, which was to improve the view. So it's difficult for me to understand why we're looking at each tree with each criteria, when in fact, I think you have to look at each, you could look at it overall and say, hey, a lot of those trees like F, G, H, I, J, M, D, and even N uh, are, are certainly ones that he wants to remove for view, which I don't think falls into the same category as whether or not it casts a shadow. Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough. I'm just trying to assess the overall, you know, the risks and costs and benefits and okay well uh, yeah I, I don't disagree with that i just wanted to know where you were going with this because i mean it does seem to me that some like let me, let me ask a question differently if we deny the use permit for tree removal would you still build the house would i yeah uh that's an unfair question really, because you're putting me in a position where i have to answer in a way that would potentially offend this panel that to do that. So, so thank you for well, and that's a hypothetical and really unfair. So, well, one of the trees falls within the footprint, so that I, I'd like to add something. I lived, or I was here during the, was it 2005 windstorms? When we, this maybe? Yeah. When we lost a lot of trees. In fact, I had worked on the house further down Scenic Drive, and the trees came within 10 feet of the house. And we're talking these massive Sitka spruce trees. And um, that storm was really unique because the trees fell in all different directions. 
because the, the winds came in and they sort of swirled. And um, you can't really predict what direction the trees can fall. I just want to add that, you know, we're looking at a tree could fall down on scenic drive or it could fall towards, you know, proposed house. We really can't predict well, that. Well, either way, it's bad news, isn't it? I mean, if there's a dislocation, yeah. any, any way those trees fell. Yeah, totally. And I'm happy. And again, I don't, I don't mean to seem competitive at all. Um, I, have give, uh, I certainly apologize if that's the impression. Well, I apologize for feeling or defensive. Um, but I guess my my hypothetical question, which I did not mean to offend you with, was that you know you you've argued that this is the minimum number of trees. I guess this question is maybe more appropriate for the commission than for you, which is: is any reason that any tree needs to be removed good enough to remove them, sort of collectively grouped together? You know, I mean, maybe that doesn't make sense, but uh, there ought to be a reason for removing each tree, and I just want to be sure there was, in fact, a reason for removing each individual tree. Right? Maybe, maybe you like, well, they're all in the view, or they're all hit the house. And so that Venn diagram fits every tree in those two. Now, there are other reasons, aside from either uh, putting shade on the house or falling on, on um, also appropriate, like uh, public safety, you know. Well, yeah, that's a very dangerous curve. For sure. Yeah. And uh, not to mention the farm building on that. Those things would be essentially a wonderful fire lighter to my roof uh, uh, to the extent that it's metal. I'll get to understand how warm it would get with ashes on it. But I'd like to uh, avoid that. I mean, there, again, there are a multitude of reasons. I wouldn't expose them all to you, but the two most prevailing are prevalent ones are. Uh, the, the safety of the, the public and my house. I mean, one of the reasons why I sort of got engaged in this overly really complex thought exercise, and I was actually prepared to ask you for like a matrix listing which reasons apply to the trees, which of course I wouldn't do now because I, I hear you all loud and clear. Um, but I think that what it comes down to is that, uh, you know, I think you could have just said the ocean views from my home and this could have probably would have. Well, well, as yes, I appreciate yeah. that you and your agent acknowledge the value in preventing questions from price. Yes, yes. Well, as Mr. Bird is um, a type A, I'm a type triple A. So I've got one last question, which again, this, this one should be a uh, completely inoffensive question. Okay. Are the native is native vegetation more fire resistant than the existing trees? I don't know that I could argue that any uh, form of vegetation that I'm aware of is more or less fire resistant. Uh, redwood trees are arguably so, but I've seen them burn up. So I, I don't but, but like shrubs with you know glossy leaves and resins and oil. It's not the per se. It's the it's the arrangement of those and creating mm -hmm. fire ladders so that on steep ground, if you have continual vegetation from where the fire ignites, and so mm -hmm. it'll it'll continue to burn until it reaches the. And right now, if someone were to throw a cigarette on on a sunny day, so and it caught a fire, it would eliminate our problem in discussion. <laughs> I mean, we saw that two years ago, right? With the fire. I mean, that was question, which again, I just want to ensure that uh, each tree that we're proposing to remove. Well, so I took care of one. Yep, that's right. Sorry, yeah. in, in firewood. Well, it will please the commission to know that I have no further questions. So um, I'll stand for other questions to present the room. Uh, questions? I don't have any further questions. I guess I will follow up on the tree discussion um, just with a note for Chris. I mean, I'm also a licensed forester and botanist. And what Neil had outlined in terms of slope stability um, regarding the trees and then with the revegetation um, is certainly something that I'm comfortable with um, in terms of keeping that slope stable. Um, those native shrubs, while they do have different root structures than the trees that are currently present there, um, they form, they also have, they're not just super shallow rooted, they also have deep roots that go down and they're, while the roots are smaller, there's more numerous of them and it's gonna be planting them in greater densities than the trees that are present. Um, so, so that makes me feel comfortable about that bank not sloughing down on the scenic drive or, something moving there. Um, so I, I just want to say that 
to maybe make you feel more yeah, efficient. Okay. I, I was just going to add, you know, tree removal has definitely been sometimes controversial in, in Trinidad, um, both for and against. Um, but I believe a lot of these trees are less than 12 inches, so it could be cut without a permit. Um, maybe, maybe it would have been better if we'd identified which ones actually required a permit, but I think the applicant was just trying to present this holistically. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think one thing we've recognized in the past with tree mm -hmm. removal permits is the use permit findings don't they fit tree removal very well. Um, and so I think when we update our ordinances that we'll probably have a different set of findings for tree removal. Just me. Considering I'm a, a little tough. Um, but I think also the bottom line is I don't think that there's really, I mean, Someone can remove, you know, request to remove a tree for whatever purpose. Yeah, they they want it doesn't. The ordinance doesn't require a specific reason. Well, again, I appreciate. Um, I was just having to do my due diligence, and we've jumped through uh, many, many. You know, that's the fun you have. Uh, yeah, you've jumped through many, many hoops thus far, and I thought that those relatively few hoops wouldn't be. Uh, to detrimental to the bill process, but thank you for everybody's patience and, and satisfied with the responses. Thanks. Any last minute questions? Okay. Um, this is an op I'm going to open it up for public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone from either here in the uh, here in this area or online. Uh, through Zoom to make comments. I would appreciate it if you could keep the comments to three minutes and we'll open it up for public comments at this point. And we would ask that if you are in the room, if you come to the microphone, so that we can make sure we have you on the record. I must say this has been an interesting uh, experience. I've never done sat in on one of these before. Uh, I live across the street. Langford Road. I'm sorry, could you state your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Leslie Zondervan Droz. And I have had the property across the road for about 44 years. Okay. Um, anyway, after the place stopped being a cow pasture, I was assuming that it was going to be built on. And I was worried that there was going to be somebody from Southern California who was going to come up and do a McMansion and want the whole neighborhood to change according to their standards. I'm very glad that it's not one of those people. Um, so, and I'm very glad about the downward facing lights too. My issue and the issue that my family has is a very different perspective than probably the other ones you're going to hear. And that is we're very protective of the forest and the wildlife. That's our main concern. Um, and it's not the view or, or anything else. So the rather unkempt view you have across the road is the way things are going to be because we want to keep it, um, except for the, the ivy, which my grandson is working on bit by bit. Um, so anyway, we're going to be, we're focused on the wildlife. The forest behind our houses on Langford and the forest that um, happens after the steep slope that, uh, that goes from your place over to the Rancheria, that forest all has some very special wildlife in it. And one thing I want you to know is that uh, Northern Scenic Drive is the southernmost part of mountain lion territory. And the mountain lions are always going to be there. So what we have done is I just don't let small grandchildren out by themselves. Okay. But about every other year in April and May, I hear the mountain lion and her cubs talking to each other below my bedroom window. Okay. And I know that one of the places they run through is that cow pasture. And so I would hope that you would arrange things not to obstruct them, 
but also to protect your small grandchildren. Um, let's see, the other thing is some of the very special wildlife that is there. I mean, it's very special. And I brought it up recently. I've been keeping it quiet, but because of what the rancheria is doing, I had to come public with it. But we have had spotted owl in our forest behind our houses there. And so one of our concerns would be, I don't care about the view or any of the other stuff, but the spotted owls have a large, fairly large territory. And I have heard them over um, at the Dobrex and in the cow pasture area, but they'd like to stay in the high trees. And so um, I don't think whatever you're gonna do is gonna affect them unless you decided to start clearing the forest between your place and the Dobrex. Because I think the wildlife actually runs through that area and come, comes over to my place. Spend some time studying about that. Based, the biggest food prey they have is a dusty footed wood rat. They love wood rats. And I have two wood rat nests on the property. Actually, the taste. barred owls that like the low critters, like the wood rats, the spotted owls tend to, to hunt in the camp. Yes, and the wood rats are arboreal and nocturnal. Oh, okay, then great. Okay. Uh, later, yeah, okay so I just wanted to express that uh, my concern is doing as little as possible to interfere with who's already living there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any public comment on uh, Zoom? Okay, hearing none. I'll bring it back to the commission. Um, any other final comments or questions or clarifications, or can we begin to discuss a motion? I guess I had a couple questions. I, don't know, I guess we'll begin to discuss a motion, maybe. I want to talk about the conditions a little bit. Okay. Um, with the proposed conditions. Condition number two. This is just a simple question. The two year period, is that to begin construction to apply for a building permit? To get a building permit. Not to complete. The That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and then my other questions were on, which you sort of explained earlier, um, conditions eight and nine. I guess when I first read those, not knowing the background information, it sounded like something that we might have might be addressed in the grading permit or by the building inspector, I guess, especially number eight. I mean, I think the grading permit or the grading permit would likely specify that the driveway drain away from the septic system and the building inspector would see to that, or is that something that well, it's not. It's not like a listed requirement in the grading ordinance. So, and and it didn't come up with the city engineer or the health department. But I, you know, I thought that was important, and so um, that would be a requirement for the grading plan when it comes for. I mean, I agree that it's important, and I don't want to. You're just wondering if it's covered elsewhere? I mean, yeah, or like if it's really our purview to put that in place versus... I think so. I think it's our purview, and I don't know that it's covered anywhere else. Okay. Thank you. And I guess I had... Um, and then on number nine, I guess I would probably... Obviously would not be covered, or I didn't think would be covered elsewhere, but... Um, My thought with adding the curb to keep vehicles from driving onto the beach field. I guess I thought that might just be the applicant's sort of responsibility to his own benefit rather than something we needed to force his hand to do. I sort of see both sides of it. I mean, yes, it would be in the applicant's interest, but a lot of people don't are might be somewhat ignorant. Like maybe the house changes hands and someone's never had a leach field before and doesn't understand that driving on that's bad. Um, 
We have had conditions before. The health department has added that for some projects. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure why they didn't require it for this one, because it seems like it would be one that they would require something like that. Um, again, and I think it is, you know, city does have an ordinance to manage and protect septic systems, so I do think it is something that it's kind Yes. Other questions, comments? Do I hear a motion? Uh, based on the information submitted in the application included in the staff report and public testimony at the hearing, I find that the project is consistent with the city's LCP and other applicable regulations. And I move to adopt the information, the design review and use permit and other findings in the staff report and approve the project as submitted and as conditioned in this report, in the staff report. Your second? Uh, I'll second, I guess I'm going to take your guess, I think. I can second too. No, well, let me go for it. <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, project is approved as as uh, submitted here tonight. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I know uh, it's a sometimes very long and detailed process, but uh, unfortunately, we're not experts in a lot of the fields that uh, others are. So, I really appreciate your patience. And I, I thank you for the time that you have called. Thank you. Graduation night for some of us here. Okay, thank you. Um, why don't we take two minutes? Don't don't feel like you have to leave. <laughs>
Item number three on our agenda, the ADU ordinance discussion regarding a draft ADU ordinance, which was continued from the November 15th, 2023 meeting. So um, I most of my staff report it, you've already seen, um, starting on page three, talks about what's new updated information. Um, not much has changed in the ordinance since you last saw it. Um, and I, there's a couple of updates and comments in the margin. I am working with the Coastal Commission on a definition of habitable area. Um, the, and the Coastal Commission had a couple of comments. Uh, so, and so those are the additions in here. So there was on page six on the conditions for projects that are within, you know, near, near a bluff. Um, basically they want to add this other condition down. I am going to follow up a little bit with them on that because um, I haven't seen it in other ordinances and they seem to keep adding stuff to, to Trinidad's ordinance um, necessarily. If Trinidad should have standards that don't apply to Humboldt County or Mendocino County, for example. Um, but so this is basically saying if the sea level rises and all of a sudden your land where the ADU is on is now below mean high tide, then it's some public land. It seems unnecessary to me, but anyway, so I'm gonna follow up a little bit with them on that, but they requested that language. And then they also we had gone back and forth a little bit on how many ADUs to allow? Uh, do we really need to include all the state ordinance language because there's just not the multifamily development in Trinidad? But, but they wanted us to add it because that's what the state law is. So there's this new section, um, 17.54.070.1, and those are location standards. And so, you know, I just wanted to avoid this ordinance is already pretty complex for Trinidad and, you know, Regulates a lot of situations that are so unlikely to come up in Trinidad. But so this is basically just from the state law um, saying where ADUs can be. They still have to meet septic requirements. I did talk to someone who said they just talked to the health department and they relaxed their standards for second units and septic systems. So that, that's another thing. I haven't talked to the health department with someone who was talking to someone. About an ADU in Trinidad said they talked to the health department and said it would be. So I I want to follow up with the health department because that would really change how many ADUs can be permitted in Trinidad. And then the sort of final issue was the issue of STRs, and so we we'll talked about that as you know at the joint meeting um, with the STR committee and city council. Um, and there was a lot to digest, so the city council wanted a little bit more time before weighing in. Uh, the STR committee didn't feel like they should weigh in and sort of was dissolved as, as a committee anyway. Um, and so at last week's city council meeting, they did take up that question. And so I've got, you know, I sort of had some questions listed. Um, they did generally agree four to one that the primary unit should be allowed to be an STR. Now that is, that's not something that's restricted in the state law, but I have seen it in some coastal ordinances. And so that's where that question came up. So the Coastal Commission may say they think the primary unit should be, should not be allowed to be an STR, but I think with our cap, I don't see why not. Um, and then, but no to the other one. So we're not allowing any kind of STR, whether even if it's home share resident STRs um, in an ADU um, with a use permit or not. So, and that's, that's what the city council voted. So you can, you know, if you feel strongly, you can certainly do something different, but that's how the ordinance is currently written based on that feedback from That's all I have. Questions, comments, clarifications from commissioners? I think Kurt, I want to say that there are currently some ADUs 
in town that are being rented as STRs. Is that that's correct, or at least some detached living spaces that um, maybe don't have a full kitchen. Or, um, so there's one that I know of for let's see. One for sure, let's see. Is there but that's the one that dropped their license this year. Oh, well, and then no, there's one, there's no, one on view, here. there's one on view, yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, there's at least one. Um, so yeah, it would probably be good to, we could add some clarifying language that says existing 80 views that our STRs can continue. So they would be grandfathered. They would be, I think they should be grandfathered. Mm -hmm. But then they wouldn't, they also wouldn't fall under this ordinance unless, so they would be existing, non-conforming. Um, so I'd probably actually add that to one of those last sections for dealing with existing so section starts at the bottom of page 15 um, of the ordinance, a packet page 70, section 17 by 4, 110. So that's the regulations for existing ADUs. Um, so maybe under the non-conforming ADU sections, somewhere in here I will put that AD, ADUs that are STRs at the time this ordinance goes into effect can be. Uh, any okay. other questions, clarifications? <laughs> so I just have a couple of general questions. Um, you know, typically what we do is we would go through this ordinance page by page, but it sounds to me like there are still several fairly significant open issues that need to be resolved before we can actually say this is ready for prime time. Oh, yes, I would not propose. I think it's certainly ready for you if you want to go through it page by page, and I, I think we have before. I didn't necessarily propose that because I think you guys have seen this ordinance quite a few times, um, and we have gone through page by page. Um, but it is not ready for adoption. Um, so the next step in the process, um, basically, I just want to follow up on those two things with the with the Coastal Commission um, language for the public lands and the habitable space, and then and then we're going to send the ordinance to HC to HCD for review. So Department of Housing and Community Development, um, they now have basically kind of veto power over ordinances that don't meet the state requirements. So once we get their sign off, then we can adopt it and send it to us. So you will see it. I, I want it to be, I don't want to have to make a bunch of changes um, after HCD reviews it, but we can certainly send them if you make modifications, we could send them just those individual modifications and ask them. Um, so, if, you know, if there's significant issues that, you know, we need to go over, then let's do that before we send it to HCD, but um, you will see it again, and it's fun. Okay. Um, what's the pleasure? Uh, I, I guess my feeling is I don't feel the need to go through page by page. I do have a couple of questions that I would like to at least get clarified tonight. So if, if we just want to kind of hit the top of the, the ADU ordinance, uh, that's fine with me too, so. Yeah, that sounds good. I just have a few things. You know, okay, well, why don't we plow right in? Uh, hold on. Okay, well, I can start and then yeah. um, we can go from there. Um, 
this is not necessarily in any order, but uh, on page five of, of 20, the of pages of the uh, ordinance, uh, your comment there at um, section D, I'm sorry, section C, uh, ADU or JADU and any associated new development shall not be permitted on a property with known archaeological resources. Uh, my experience in the past has been that most tribal, well, I shouldn't say most, tribal organizations do not want to reveal, review, reveal, excuse me, reveal where archaeological things are. Yeah. So to me, the question raised of whether or not to include it, um, it's unlikely that that would even, they certainly won't do a map. No, I doubt it now. No way they'll do a map. So I guess it's more of a comment that, than anything, but I um, I just don't think that that be anything that we can enforce because we won't know. I had a similar question on that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 And we've talked a little bit about it before, and it's a tough one. It's a standard that I think the Coastal Commission wanted in there, but how do we? I mean. Maybe staff has a map, and so staff can say, okay, I know this is a sensitive area, so that's a question. Maybe I'll ask the Coastal Commission if they expect a map or what they expect. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, archaeological uh, resources don't necessarily have to be indigenous resources, mm -hmm. yeah. but at the same time, I think trying to, I, I just found that that find that's going to be very difficult to even accomplish. So, yeah, you know. I don't, and, you know, I think, as I sort of alluded to before, we're almost getting to the point where some comments I've heard that they would consider all of Trinidad as it's an easy map to make then. <laughs> Anything 45 <laughs> Uh, yeah, aside from, um, you know, the, the, I know that you still have to work with the um, Coastal Commission and, and, and Housing Organization, I don't really have any other specific comments, but I didn't want to get that one today. Um, I have on page, back page 62, page 7 of 20. Of um the very bottom letter C I feel like maybe we talked about this isn't that changing so like is that going to get flagged by HCD saying you can't sell the ADU from, from the primary unit that is, is... there's something changing there where you can like independently sell the oh. ADU from the primary unit I don't know how that's you supposed maybe, to be that does but I feel like I'm familiar familiar that the law did just change. Okay. Postal Commission didn't flag it. They're not necessarily up on that. I think you... That can be real problematic when it comes to septic. This, right. Yeah, I don't... I don't know. I have no idea how that's supposed to be. Yeah, I, uh, it, I mean, that seems like a... You know, it's basically a default subdivision. I don't understand how that... Works, but I mean, there already was SB nine, um, and then they, I, yeah, they just applied it to the coastal zone. Right? So, Today, to this, it changes so much over the year. Okay, I will look at that. One. Uh, okay, the next page. Data twenty. I'm just responding to your comments. Uh, TP five. You're asking if we want a new meter for an ADU if it's larger than eight hundred square feet. Uh, personally, I don't see necessarily see the advantage of that. Um, but like requiring that, it seems like it's if that's what the homeowner wants to do. Sure, if they don't, they can say. 
thousand dollars or whatever a PG new, new PG new line costs. Um, so I'm inclined to not require it. Census on that. I think so. Sounds like. It. Okay. Uh, I'll keep going. Yeah, keep going. Okay, page ten of twenty, back to page sixty-five. Um, D ten, talking about mapping all these various conferences, if you will. Uh, I, I, I guess I don't feel like we need to map those. I think that's something that um, the administrator, I guess, can just sort of identify on a case-by-case -case basis rather than having a map with a million circles. I mean, unless that, that everyone else feels differently. I mean, I like the map that has that you attached to at the end. Mm -hmm. That shows some of the various encumbrances um, or regulations, um, appeal areas, and such. But some of these things, um, I guess, are just like, it's like kind of too small to map, basically. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get so many that I can't just look and right. read. <laughs> And I guess, you know, it could be complicated if they change the bus stop or out of bus. I think there's been talk about that in a second. Um, all right, uh, 11 of 20, next page, TB11, regarding definitions of newly constructed. Um, I would agree with your assessment there um, that it basically doesn't apply to JEDUs, it just applies to like breaking ground construction. Do I guess and, the question, and maybe it's a question for the building inspector. I haven't seen that as a definition, so I, I think it's sort of a commonly understood, but I could see where someone could try and argue it. Um, but I think <laughs> If we all understand what it means, so still, no, uh, still, still, some clarification required there. Oh, I could say all newly constructed first or or newly converted from non habitable space. And I think that would clarify. Pretty the not having the space. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So, okay. not to nitpick, but um, a garage would have a specific size entryway, which may not be ADA compliant. And, you know, if you've got a stone or concrete structure, that would be somewhat problematic to uh, comply. Okay, so not just remodeled space because the door, the entrance and exits are significant. I mean, it can be done, but is that what we want? I guess is the question. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Not that we had any great clarity on that last one. Well, uh, you mean the, on the construction ADA yeah. complaint? I would, I would, we just say on new construction. Okay. I, and I will see, I have a question here for if. I will ask what HCD understands that to mean.
Chris? Okay. Be honest with the agenda to focus on the, the, the three questions that were presented to the council. Yeah. So I'll check in with you folks and see whether you were sort of in agreement with those or not. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I guess in my opinion, uh, I would, uh, disagree with the council on the second question. Um, I think that SDR should be allowed in ADUs because I think I would justify that with the fact that we have a cap. See, so if anyone's building an ADU anywhere, it's still an additional housing unit in the city, it's not an additional STR city, but yes, she, okay. I wasn't at the meeting. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was some concern that Well, well, you're thinking about that. I will add, I I have some concerns on that one. I don't disagree with you, but I think because it's in the state law that says ADUs won't be STRs, I think that is, that would be a tough one to get by HCD. And so unless, I, you know, there's a real consent, strong consensus on that, I would say let's not try and is, uh, is that just administerially or ministerially approved ADUs, or this is any? Well, that's a, that's that could be a question. So, um, yes, so I think it's yes, it's only the ministerially approved. So, um, I do think that you could allow an option for someone to apply for a use permit, basically an exception. You could do that. Oh, even given the current, or okay, I guess yeah. So when I read what the city council voted on, it made it sound like that situation. But maybe I, I think I misread the way this was written. That that situation was if you built an ADU with a use permit. Oh, and actually, I'm sorry, my. Maybe it was confusing because my reference should have been um, I guess uh, what you're what they voted on is can you apply for a use permit to use an ADU as an STR? But I guess what I was thinking was can you apply for a use permit to build an ADU to be used as an STR? Yes. Well, that's what I, you'd have, so just like, you know, the, the ministerial approvals, um, I, so what I, I think I should have been referencing the answer to number two as instead of number one, based on, you know, based on the answer to number two. Oh, yes. With or without a user permit. They really didn't specifically vote on that. Um, so yeah, so the ministerial approvals only apply to, you know, up to 800 square feet, whatever those sizes are, heights. If you want something bigger, you can apply for a use permit um, to have something that exceeds those sort of, that envelope that HCD has set up for these ministerial approvals. So to me, it seems like, Allowing it to be an STR would be outside that envelope, and that you should be able to apply for a regular permit um, to have. You just don't get the ministerial approval. That's, I, I, don't, I don't get the sense that that was the intent of the city council's vote. I I don't I don't think so. I I don't think so either. But I think you. I'm just telling you. I think you. I think you have that. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. That makes sense to me, and I think that that's a reasonable. And I'm not approach. sure. I think, you know, I think the council's answer was no, 
but they didn't really get into that the nuance of it. That's, um, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah. So, are we? Do we have a recommendation then? <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, I just sort of fundamentally disagree with their votes to uh, on item number one. I, I've sort of been schooled tonight on proposing um, hypotheticals, but someone could theoretically build like a 25 foot tall, or I guess 18 if we're negotiating the height, ADU. Just for the sake of having additional things on the property and then move it. Primary is it like I mean I, I understand the benefits of ADUs and I understand the benefits of STRs, but I also understand that ADUs have the each character of right yeah. Do you probably make sense? I guess. So just trying to figure out what Well, they could they could ministerially have a STR that is in that home. So with the height. Besides, yes, we've been to that. And so they can sort of like strategically with the primary residence as an STI some additional improvements that we saw. I'm going to do that. Actually, that doesn't seem that much different to me than from just the I agree with that. Yep. The workaround for sure. Well, and then you always have to consider the cap. Well, and that, that's what I think is somewhat unique about Trinidad, right. in you know, and and I think you know the economics of it is is sort of difficult. I'm sure it's case by case for individuals, but I think as Tristan has pointed out, that situation of being able to have an STR could make it more affordable for someone to buy a property in Trinidad. Yes. Like my, my response to that argument last time was that you know that also becomes an asset on the property that increases the potential sales price of the house and so on and so forth. So it's That's not necessarily right. it's not good, yeah. create real affordable housing necessarily. Okay. Right. Nor does it really create an additional housing unit. If you and this was a comment I was going to make earlier, right? There is there there was some concern that the ADU ordinance and the STR ordinance shouldn't stand on their own merits, right? Be sort of separate entity. You should rely on the cap. As you get drafted in the ADU. It's a really concern sure. that I share, but it was a concern that was. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So what are we. I, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> the only one I really have a strong recommendation on is that. Full time STR should not be allowed in an ADU um, without approval of each. Without what? Without approval of each. So, not ministerial ADUs, they can't be STRs. That's the only thing I'm clear on from the state law. Um, I think that the Coastal Commission at their December meeting, I can send you the link. I actually. I didn't finish, get a chance to finish watching it, um, but they had a presentation and discussion on STRs and housing and affordability and ADUs. Um, and the parts that I did watch, there is some, um, yeah, I think when, when we adopted our ADU ordinance or STR ordinance, there really wasn't studies or evidence showing one way or another how STRs affected property values, for example, occupancy. And I think in, in Trinidad, I mean, in, there's some things that make logical sense as how they would affect Trinidad, but I also think that Trinidad's demographics had actually showed the opposite in some ways. Um, but now they have some more studies. Now, again, these are bigger cities and not, you know, Everything's you know, like drivers of housing prices in, in Trinidad are very different than in many places, and you're just you're just not ever going to get real affordable housing, regardless of what you do. But um, yeah, I think the Coastal Commission is probably going to want to see more limits on STRs and ADUs than that. It's my impression. Which goes beyond the state. 
And in, in that vein, I'm sort of thinking that like there's the price surprise, like a significant difference between like San Diego or Manhattan Beach and Trinidad. Right? Like I, I acknowledge that you know building a 25 to ADU just for the sake of renting a house in STR probably doesn't fundamentally change the character of Manhattan Beach too much. But here, yes, absolutely. Yeah. He also said that there's some, but not all of the close commission staff are sort of uh, in agreement about the extent to which this thing should be reined in or not. Yeah, and again, that was before the December meeting. They didn't necessarily give me additional guidance after this December meeting. I, they suggested I watch it, but I think I think it's really. Um, they, you know, they did recently certify the Humboldt County's ADU ordinance, and I believe, I think they mentioned, like, Mike Wilson, he specifically said the primary unit not be allowed to be an STR, and that ended up in the ordinance. For, as an example. Um, of, but staff, but that's just one commissioner, and they went along with it, and I think Humboldt County was fine with it. I think actually Mike Wilson suggested that before it got to hearing and Humboldt County said it might be different if Trinidad pushed back and said no, don't agree with that because and have a reason for it. I think the cap is primary. And so I don't I see, you know, both sides on on this one. Um, and I don't have a strong recommendation one way or the other. Well, what what then is our what, what what then is our action that we want to take? Do we want to make other recommendations to the city council for these three issues, uh, or do we want to see how coastal commission and housing authority? Uh, well, that's that's what I I think. If you guys have a strong consensus here, then that's what we present to HCD and see what they say. I'm not sure that we have a strong consensus here. Yeah, that's uh -huh. part of the problem. Yeah. Right. I guess I could I could just pose the question to HCD and see how they would interpret these questions. I think asking a specific question to them probably yeah. would be the most direct way to get any uh, uh, uh yeah. okay. ordinance together. Okay. <laughs> But does HCD and the Coastal Commission do all sound the same thing? So that's well, I think yes. I think necessarily be in concert with one another in terms of well, I think I think HCD is gonna stick to the letter of the law. Coastal Commission goes beyond it does their own. No, I mean, um, the Coastal Act has broader applications, and there there's more, um, more ability for interpretation in Coastal Act and and regulation. So so that's it's not just that they they do their own thing. It's they have more. They have a broader scope and they have more leeway to interpret things. Um, and I think this is an issue that is somewhat in flux. Um, and so we can't necessarily even predict exactly what the commission's going to do. And that's where Coastal Commission staff was sort of like, they didn't have a strong recommendation either, except to follow HCDs, the, you know, the letter of that, that state law. Any further comments? I mean, just to, so that you folks can make informed decisions, I'll say that I know across the board on one through three. Yeah, do with that what you may. Well, at least we could. Um, uh, yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Thank you for Yeah. Well, um, I think the 
the recommendation was is to ask the house. I can I can put these scenarios to HCD and see if they raise red flags for them. That's sort of the first hurdle. And and then it would be And we still have to hear back from both organizations before we can really put the final seal of approval on this anyway. So. At least, but I think you want to get it pretty close to what you want before we give it to them because we don't want to make a bunch of changes after. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, 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 approval will come after there. Other energy questions for us? So, I, like I said, just um, if you have any, um, I will pose these scenarios to HCD and see is this acceptable? Is this a, you know, um, and just get that answer back, and um, and that will help inform your next discussion. And um, so, yes, yeah, as, as long as you don't see any red flags anywhere here, um, we're ready to you know, button up a couple of things with Coastal Commission and then send them off to PC. Any last minute comments before I ask for public comment? All right. Uh, this is the opportunity for anyone from the public to comment on the ADU. Agenda item. Uh, we have no public here in town hall, but I do see some people on uh, Zoom. So, is there any public comment? Again, I would ask that you identify yourself and please limit your comments to three minutes. <clears throat> All right, I don't see any hands raised. So I'll bring it back for any last minute <laughs> questions, comments from the commissioners. All right, hearing none. And this was just for a review and as I recall, right? Yeah. Well, Dis discussion right. regarding draft, right? No action needs to be taken. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is um, Commissioner reports. Any of the commissioners would like to report? The um, <clears throat> council disbanded the short term rental committee, which I was serving on. And so now I'm just floating around with tons of spare time. And uh, if there's something the planning commission needs me to do, I'm at your disposal. Seriously, I'm going to start here. You want to work on the website? Uh, somebody <laughs> better. <laughs> Uh, I'll just mention that the next public meeting for the Trinidad Community Coastal Resilience Planning Project is uh, March 7th. And um, yeah, March 7th, uh, 6 p.m. And that is not going to be a Zoom meeting, I understand. Is that correct? I would guess it'd be a hybrid. I would guess it'd be hybrid. Okay. It's, it's interesting the way the flyer reads. It's in-person meeting. Okay. Well, it's just fire out. I knew the meeting yeah, they the, picked a date, but I had a banner. Okay. I will. I will clarify. And uh, the uh, the draft document is not out for public yet. Is um, the coastal resilience action plan and. Uh, <laughs> I love acronyms, and so. I just realized what that acronym is, and I just, I have a lot of fun with that. I guess you need the ocean coastal. Uh, Staff report. Anything you'd like to report? Um, Other than on the CRAP? <laughs> um, no, you know, just, um, Continuing to work on probably the same stuff I mentioned at the last meeting. I have restarted a conversation about the website. So 
Um, and I am sort of collecting a list of what needs to be done. Um, so I think Jennifer is learning how to program, you know, change and add stuff on the website. And so I'm going to start working with her and Gabe on let's make some changes. So if anybody has any suggestions, I can start compiling those because it's, I sort of assumed, oh, we'll get it live and then we'll continue to work on it. No, no one has worked on it and it's terrible. Um, I can't, I can't find any. Um, so, so I'm working on that. Um, looks like we might have a full agenda in March because we've got um, Tristan's project plus the um, trails. Um, I'll just mention one thing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, anything else on staff report? New. Okay. Uh, any comments on future action items? I have one that I'm somewhat reluctant to, <laughs> <laughs> which is that uh, in the, I guess it's now three or four experiences I've had with design review, we've always come across that 2,000 square foot guideline. And now officially in 100% of those, we've missed that. And admittedly, it's just a guideline, but rationale for it and potential implications of it, I think deserve like real consideration of something that we actually have to support or not as we go. Okay. Were you here when we were still talking about the design criteria? I don't think so. Were you? Okay. Well, I'm, I'll I think you're pointing at Chris, right? Yeah, yeah, all right, you. Uh, seems familiar, it's been quite a year. But... Okay, I will. So we did sort of right. run through some design, new design criteria for the LCP update. I think you're right. Um, yeah. And ho hopefully that will clarify. But let me send that to you um, and see if that answers. That's, that's probably why I keep feeling like I'm beating a dead horse because every time it uh, comes up, I'm just like, what the hell is it? I just routinely ignore it every time it appears before us. Oh, yeah. So, well, not every time, I guess, not with the, the lighthouse. Whose project was that we did? The Vanderpool? The Vanderpool project. But it was something that was mentioned, right? I mean, that, that wasn't necessarily the, the limiting factor, but that was a no, there were other projects. There have been some. I mean, I think, I think there have been, there have been some projects where size was an issue and De um, definitely, but I think it also, you know, you tend to get people who, um, that wasn't always the case, but I think you get more of like a better design so that they can make those arguments that well, it's not just a 2000 square foot box or right. whatever. And so I think that's been the approach and to, you know, lower the profile so it's not affecting views. And then you look at, I think everybody pushes that 25%. Um, yeah, well, let me let me retract my suggestion that we revisit it in the future because it seems that we have recently. Um, just, but it's it's a I, you know, it's, it's a valid it. it's a valid observation and. And it was actually I was kind of struck by the fact that uh, the notice the technologies that applied to the as well. This. Uh, the permit situation where three percent square foot of losses area is pretty discrepancy that between those two and I have that type of situation. And I will say I think I think it was before my time, but I think around the late nineties, even early two thousand, um there was a planning commission who really pretty strictly held um to that 2,000 square foot, so there's been somewhat different interpretations. Um, but then, but then you also with that one, with that, that was the era where just the, you probably have Jim Cuthbertson's old house off the south side of Edwards, and it's basically a 2,000 square foot box on top of a 2,000 square foot box garage. So it's a 4,000 square foot box. Now they held them to 2,000 square feet, 
Was that a good design? That might be why I live in a 1970 square foot box. <laughs> uh, any further comments on it? Okay, I'll just mention one thing, and I don't know whether it really requires a future agenda item, but uh, I do know that there's an effort uh, between the museum, the library, and uh, the land trust to put some signage up at Saunders Park for um, some of the uh, transient issues that have occurred up there. And I know they're working with uh, the city to fund the signs and also working with Gene Bass, who is specific security on um, what ordinances or what regulations need to be on those signs. And I don't know what, and I, what I'm getting at is, I don't know what the size is, you know, that uh, they should at least be aware of what some of the rules are. And would that come to us or? Probably not. I guess I've got to sort of see the like the size and specifics, but I think public safety and directional signs are normally not subject to design review. And then also if they're not intended to be visible from off site. So, I mean, it might be at the driveway entrance, but if it's something that's, you know, on the site in the parking lot, that's not going to be design review. I will make them aware that maybe they should just run the design past you. Okay. Right. One last one last thing that occurs to me. Um, should the planning commission have sort of like an envoy to the ongoing Rancheria project? Mm -hmm. Should it be some I guess they probably are like government, government committees that exist for that sort of thing, but I don't know, somebody who's abreast of what their intents are. Maybe they would let that mean they wouldn't. Well, let's see. Seems like some of their meetings are have been open to the public. So like there's a like a task force or something. Um, oh, there was a meeting last night. Oh, that was a public presentation, but they have like a task force that like Elaine Weinra um, and there's some other West Haven folks have attended. Um, so it seems to be open to the public. And then there's been more some, some staff level meetings where like Eli and myself and Josh Wolf, GHT was there. Um, but I will I will look into the task force and see if there's yeah yeah I mean well, being hard that this becomes an agenda I'm not just really curious whether there should be a planning commissioner who's constantly abreast of it and ruins their planning because it's going to affect that's kind of thing yeah I think I think um, but the way that Rancheria likes to work with the city is on a government to government level. And I would think that as I understand it now, there are only allowed to be two council members at the government to government meetings to prevent having to comply with Brown Act. Well, that, and that's a different two each time, too, because if it's the same two, then it's a standing committee and they are still subject to it. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it gets complicated. Yeah. And well, so I think I think at this point we're, well, like I said, staff has been involved in some staff level meetings. So staff, professional staff. I don't know how much council's been involved. But like I said, there there is also this task force that does seem to have some members of the public involved. So I will look into whether that might be an avenue. That would be good to have. Yeah, there's going to be a lot that's going on you know, based on their mm -hmm. development plan. So um, it'd be worthwhile to just see what we need to be in. Involved in. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I've been getting inquiries about, you know, they, they're doing, you know, a lot of the background reports and mapping and biological search, you know, that kind of stuff right now. Um, so I've, I've got some questions. A small part. Well, yeah, and, and sorry not to cut you off. Um, it might be worthwhile to um, 
request or ask the city council if they want the planning commission to do a little bit more than normal review of the draft EIR, which will be, well, the knobs out now, notice of publication, preparation, excuse me. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I bet it'll be a year. Well, yeah. Uh, it depends on how they're fast tracking it. Yeah, they're, mm -hmm. they're trying for like eight months, I think. Okay. Okay. I've got a plan because maybe it's aggressive development plan. <laughs> okay. Anything else before we adjourn? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.